Welcome back, class, to this second lecture on the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I want to look at some particular passages in this uh, <clears throat> in this lecture to uh, look at some of the actual texts of uh, of Luke. Before we get there, I just want to say real quick that Luke Acts is among the best group uh, Greek in the New Testament. So. Uh, they're, the author's certainly aware of the Hebrew Bible, but when I say Hebrew Bible, I mean the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The passages that he quotes all come from there. Uh, so uh, pay attention to that, but, but the Greek, the, the structure, the language, it's very good Greek. It's still Koine Greek, but uh, Luke Acts, um, the letter to James, and uh, the letter to the Hebrews, this is the best Greek in the New Testament uh, without real comparison with the rest of everything else. But uh, I want to look at uh, a couple things beyond just kind of the, the Greek and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> how does Luke portray Jesus is important, uh, and I we'll get to that. But uh, the, the prelude is incredibly important. This is the only gospel with the prelude. Uh, the Gospel of John has has something like a prelude, but um, Luke's prelude is only four verses, and it really is a legitimate prelude to like an autobiography uh, or a biography in the Greco-Roman world. And I want to, I'm going to read it to you, uh, and when I read it, I want you to, I'm going to kind of parse it out for you because it's something really, there's quite a few really important sections to these short, uh, short verses. <clears throat> So this is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, since many have undertaken to set down uh, an orderly account. Luke is telling his audience that he knows that there are other Gospels out there. Uh, many, as, as a matter of fact, since many have done this. So he knows he's not the first one doing it. He's telling us that, uh, he's letting us know that there are other gospels out there uh, about the, the life of Jesus. Verse two says, just as they were handed on to us. So there are traditions that were handed on to Luke, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Uh, so these eyewitnesses are very important. These are probably the original disciples or apostles uh, that were sent out. And so uh, Luke has the, those traditions. Those traditions are what's been passed down. But Luke's also letting us know that he is not an eyewitness, uh, that he is the recipient of the traditions from these eyewitnesses and those who have gone before. So Luke is at, at least second generation. <clears throat> I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, so he decided to write a gospel too, uh, but after investigating from the very first, he says, so uh, what is the nature of this investigation? To write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus, as Bart uh, Ehrman says in the readings, simply means lover of God. So it could be like all you know people out there um, or it could have been a guy named Theophilus. Theophilus. It, it doesn't make that much of a difference, to be honest with you. Um, what's important here is that Luke's starting to write his gospel, and he's letting us know that he's using some resources. Um, I, um, I, too, decided after investigating everything carefully. Investigating everything carefully probably means he, he got as many resources as he could find. And we think that we as in scholars think that he definitely had a Gospel of Mark in front of him. Uh, and the Q source, this is the synoptic problem again, right? So he has at least those two sources and possibly another source that some scholars call L, which is unique to Luke. Luke was the only one to have it. So there's uh, in Luke's Gospel, there are large quotations from Mark that he just incorporates. He doesn't quote Mark like, this is what the Gospel of Mark says. He just incorporates it and large sections of Q that he does the same thing with. And, and there's quite a bit of material that's unique to, to um, Luke. And then he says, so that you may know the truth 
concerning the things about which you have been instructed. In other words, <clears throat> does we know he has a gospel of Mark. I mean, he just has two large of the sections of Mark in his gospel. And we know that he has the gospel of Q. And he's saying, I'm going to write this account so that you can know the truth. So the question is, does Luke, is this an, uh, a critique of the gospel of Mark? Um, or is he, I, I, it sounds certainly like a critique. Uh, or is he taking Mark and saying, okay, this gospel is deficient and I have to kind of really tell the truth and, and turn this into a narrative that makes sense. Well, we know that the Acts of the Apostles has a huge influence uh, on uh, the Gospel of Luke because he, he wrote that too, and he, this is, it was the second volume. Uh, so he knew that was coming, and uh, he really does uh, reimagine uh, Jesus and uh, retells the story of Jesus and looks at Jesus in a very different way than Mark did. Uh, and uh, the way he uses Q is, is different than the way Matthew used Q. So we know that Luke is, is doing something unique here and doing something on his own. Uh, and one of the biggest uh, contributions that the Gospel of Luke gives uh, early Christianity is his concentration on Jesus as a prophet. Uh, throughout the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is portrayed in his birth, in his ministry, and even in his death as a prophet. <clears throat> so we, we see that Luke has a, a deep understanding of what, well, he, he has a deep conviction about what a prophet was supposed to be like. And the way it, it plays out in the life of Jesus, according to the Gospel of Luke, is that uh, Jesus was, gonna, is, was a prophet of God, is a prophet of God, and that those prophets were always rejected by God's own people. And so uh, the prophets that uh, Luke uses as examples were always the ones that were kind of marginalized from the Jewish people themselves or were prophets sent to non-Jews. Uh, so let's kind of get into the prophetic nature uh, of Jesus. And it happens in the infancy narratives. And I, I didn't say enough in that last. Um, I didn't say enough in that last lecture about the infancy narratives. The infancy narrative in Luke is completely different than the infancy infancy narratives in Matthew. Uh, Ehrman does a, a brilliant job talking about the differences in those narratives and and why. So spend your time reading Ehrman and paying real close attention. Uh, to those verses, go back and reread it. It won't take you that long to read chapter 1 and 2 of, of Matthew and chapter 1 and 2 of Luke and just really kind of parse out the differences. Uh, Ehrman talks about the, the difference in location, um, like both Gospels have Na uh, uh, Nazareth and Gal in, um, Bethlehem being important, but in incredibly different ways. So Pay close attention to that. that. The birth narratives are so different, in fact. It's the reason why we don't think Luke and Matthew uh, knew each other or, or had a copy of each other's gospel with them. The other thing that, that makes it really different is the fact that the way Luke narrates the birth of Jesus uh, is, is totally different than Matthew, but incredibly similar to uh, the birth narrative of the prophet Samuel, which is found in um, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. So you could pause this video now and, and look that up and read it. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2, uh, it's very, you have a woman who's having a miraculous conception, just like Mary is, is going to have this miraculous child, so is uh, this mother in First Samuel, uh, and then you get these songs uh, by the mothers of praising God, but also this uh, role reversal, this divine reversal that those who are exalted will be brought down, and those who are humble will be lifted up. That that is a major thing that runs throughout the Gospel of Luke and ties into Luke's concept of this social issues in and of its day. 
uh, and, and the money ethic that runs through Luke and Acts. I alluded to this, well, I talked a lot about this uh, or in the last lecture about apocalyptic um, a suspension, that there is a belief that the end, you know, the, the world will end, but no time soon, so there's a justice to be done now. This kind of divine reversal plays into that conception. But if, if you want to look at a birth narrative that is close to Luke, the way Luke narrates Jesus' birth, it's not found in Matthew. That's, that is the counterexample, if there's anything there. Uh, but the, the, the model for Luke's birth narrative of Jesus is found in 1 Samuel. Uh, so it, it'd be worth spending some time looking at that. And why that's important is because Luke is saying, by modeling Jesus' birth after this uh, prophet, he's saying that Jesus is a prophet. If, if, if Jesus was kind of the new Moses in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is the new prophet, the prophet of God. Um, and, it's, and it starts with the birth of Jesus uh, himself. And then the, the first thing you get after this birth narrative and um, the first public ministry that Jesus has in Luke is very different than what you get in Mark and Matthew. Mark has Jesus preaching at Capernaum right away. Matthew follows that chronology. Uh, but it's only later in Matthew and Mark that Jesus preaches that infamous sermon in Nazareth. In the Gospel of Luke, that's the first sermon that Jesus gives. Uh, and that, is, that sets the stage for everything that follows in Jesus' ministry. And it deeply roots him as a prophet from the very beginning. So in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30, we get this section uh, of Jesus' first sermon in the Gospel of Luke. And that sermon's not in Capernaum. That sermon's in Nazareth, in his hometown of Nazareth. Um, now, again, this happens much later, uh, kind of in the middle of Jesus' ministry in uh, Mark and Matthew. But Luke puts it right here at the very beginning. And it shows that Jesus is a prophet. Uh, so at the very beginning, he, he reads the, the uh, passage from Isaiah, this prophetic passage, and he says, this is fulfilled in your ears, claiming uh, to be a prophet kind of in the reading of that scripture. The other thing that's real important to note in, in, in this inaugural sermon in the Gospel of Luke that sets the stage for everything else, um, when Jesus preached this first sermon in Nazareth, uh, it was not received well. Um, it says that the Jews who heard it were angry and wanted to stone him. Uh, so it was a it was a terrible experience. And uh, and after they rose up in opposition, Jesus uses two other examples from uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, and his examples of prophets. He said Elijah went to a Gentile woman, right? a Gentile widow, and then he says Elijah went to a, a Gentile man, Naaman, uh, who was the leader of the Syrian army, right? So, um, in, in, in to reply to their anger, Jesus uses two examples from the Old Testament of Jewish prophets who were sent to Gentiles uh, directly at the expense of the Jews. Uh, and so this becomes a pattern in the God, early in Jesus' ministry and it follows the whole gospel, and it, certainly, and it only gets amplified in the Acts of the Apostles. And that's the sense that Jesus uh, was a prophet of God, and when he prophesied, God's own people, the Jews, rejected it. And therefore, that message went to Gentiles. Uh, that is a theme throughout uh, the gospel of Luke, and again, uh, gets carried over into, into the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, but it, and this is how Luke portrays Jesus as a prophet, and it's how Luke understands the role of a prophet. Luke understood that prophets uh, would proclaim the word of God, uh, and the people of God would um, refuse it, and even um, seek to kill the prophet. And so not only would they reject the message, they would reject the messenger himself. Now, what's, problem, what's problematic here is how anti-Jewish uh, that message is. Uh, 
And it's one thing to be anti-Jewish when you're Jewish and are, are kind of um, competing factions within Judaism. Uh, it's even another thing to be like a minority Gentile group uh, kind of criticizing a majority Jewish group. Um, all that's one thing. It's another thing when interpreters later who were from a majority Gentile where power is, a power to oppress Jews, when you interpret this message in that setting, it can be used to destroy uh, Jews and Jewish people. And that's certainly been the history of Christianity from Constantine until the Holocaust. And so, and still today in a lot of anti-Semitism. So this is the, this is the huge, it's not just a word of caution. This is a tale of caution. Uh, be very careful when you're interpreting this message in the Gospel of Luke because it's certainly there. And I think Ehrman is right in pointing that out. Uh, Luke absolutely sees Jesus as a prophet of God that preached to Jews. The Jews rejected that and sought to kill him, and they did. Uh, but that was indicative of him being a prophet because that's what happened to prophets, according to Luke. So Jesus was born a prophet. His whole ministry was characterized as a prophet. And then finally, uh, the way Luke portrays Jesus' death is, is important too because there you get Jesus martyred as a prophet. And, and read Airmen because Airmen is real. It's interesting the way he kind of um, frames this, the, the death of Jesus. He, he basically says uh, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus didn't die for people's sins. That's not what, how salvation came. Um, Jesus died as an innocent martyr. And that the innocence of his death was what was supposed to convict people and draw people to repentance uh, from their sins that caused it. So uh, I think that's a real interesting uh, take on that. If In your papers on salvation, consider this. Uh, read that part of Ehrman again. Uh, kind of unpack what he's trying to say, and that, that could be helpful in your papers on salvation. But as we turn to the last chapters of Luke, uh, specifically, specifically chapter 23, uh, we, Luke frames Jesus' death as uh, a martyrdom of a prophet. Uh, throughout the crucifixion narrative, uh, the death uh, narrative, Jesus is always sure. Um, it, he's never kind of afraid. He never struggles. Matthew and, and, and uh, Mark, both really have Jesus struggling with this, but in Luke, Jesus is always sure and is sure of his death as a martyr and, and never really wavers. So in chapter 23, verse 28, he's being crucified and he looks at women who are mourning his death and he says, daughters of Jerusalem, do not mourn for me. Do not weep for me. But he basically says, weep for your children uh, because you know, you're the ones who are rejecting me kind of thing. Um, but it, even, even as he's being crucified, he's totally in control. He's like, don't mourn for me. daughters of Jerusalem. Don't weep for me. Just a couple of verses later in chapter, uh, 23, verse 34, uh, the people who are crucifying him, that's where he goes, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Again, not a picture of someone in agony or struggling with death. No, take this cup from me, nothing like that. This is, uh, you know, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, and then just a couple of verses later in verse 42, uh, this is where he's having a conversation with the two thieves. And one of the thieves is actually kind of coming around and saying, hey, you know, I, I want what you got. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Again, this is not somebody struggling uh, with his own death. Uh, and then finally, in verse 46, uh, Jesus finally says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So there is kind of the, the, the grand finale of him giving his life over. And what's absolutely not in the Gospel of Luke 
that is in both Mark and Matthew. And if he had a copy of Mark in his hand, uh, sorry, class, my computer went dead. So if, if he's writing this crucifixion story and he has a copy of Mark in his hands, he knows that Mark has Jesus dying on the cross saying, my God, my God, why haven't you, why have you forsaken me? That is not in Luke. Luke does not do that. Uh, so he takes that off of Jesus' lips and has Jesus dying a noble death uh, of a prophet uh, being martyred, an innocent prophet being martyred by people who would not receive the message. So that is the nature of it. That's, that's who Jesus is in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I hope that's interesting to you. Uh, if you have any questions about the Gospel of Luke, uh, please send me an email. Take care.